Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Well, welcome back, and we're uh, we're continuing on with this discussion of Schrodinger's equation in one dimension. Uh, if I can recap what we established in the last lecture, I'd like to do that uh, up front. What we said is, we said we were going to invent a function called capital Psi of x and t. This function is going to describe how this de Broglie wave changes in space and time. And we wrote down this wave function Psi in terms of two functions. One is a function solely of x, called small Psi of x. And the other function is a function solely of time, function of t. Right? Schrodinger then hypothesized that these, these two, uh, these two uh, functions could be represented by exponentials. He represented the uh, spatial, part of, spatial part of the wave function in terms of uh, uh, e to the i k x. And he uh, represented the time-dependent part of the wave function as a, by this e to the minus i omega t. A is the amplitude of the, uh, it's a multiplicative coefficient that multiplies these two exponential functions. Uh, it's a very important at this stage that, that the uh, notation and the meaning behind this arithmetic is crystal clear. Right? And so I'd like to spend just a few seconds to, uh, to uh, remind you about complex notation and to try to, to uh, think about what that wave equation or what that wave function means in terms of uh, this exponential notation. So this is a very brief review. And uh, let me just remind you that if, if you have a, an exponential function that is written as a e to the i uh, theta, this is equivalent to uh, a multiplied times cosine of theta plus i sine theta. We say that this function has a real part and an imaginary part we list two axes. One is labeled real and the other is labeled imaginary. And we can plot the components of these, these uh, of the real and imaginary part of the function uh, in this complex plane. Right? So the red line, for instance, is represented by the cosine theta function. Uh, the blue line is represented by the sine of theta function. The blue line is at a 90 degree angle with respect to the red line because the real axis is at a 90 degree angle with respect to the imaginary axis. Okay? So, if we now take the uh, Schrodinger's uh, hypothesis for the uh, exponential form of the wave function, and if we write that out, what we can see is that, following Euler's notation here, this, this quantity that is written in the very compact form, e to the i kx times x minus omega t, Right? That's really equivalent to writing out this, this rather long, involved trigonometric expression. Each, each term uh, has a real and imaginary component, and uh, the one term involves only x, the other term only involves uh, time t. And the challenge is to try to understand what that, what that function is, is, is trying, what information is that function trying to convey to us. So one thing I've learned is that uh, students tend to conf confuse this real and imaginary axis with either the uh, x-axis or the time axis. And that absolutely can't happen, and I try to make the case here. Right? When you write this function in terms of a real, a real and an imaginary component, right? The, ac the axes that you use to plot the real and imaginary components have absolutely nothing to do with x or t. Rather, x or t is a third axis that's perpendicular to, let's say, the real imaginary plane. So I try to illustrate that qualitatively here, where this blue line represents the x-axis. And at any point along this x-axis, you can draw a real and an imaginary axis, and you can plot this wave function psi if I tell you what omega is, if I tell you what k sub x is, if I tell you what x is, and I tell you what time t is. Because I can evaluate the real part of this expression, and that will be represented by this, this uh, length here, 
I can also evaluate the imaginary part of this uh, uh, expression. That will be represented by this, this vertical line at this particular point x uh, uh, along the x-axis. Okay, So <clears throat> it's very important to keep that straight, otherwise you get very, very confused, very complicated uh, uh, arithmetic that, um, that tends to be baffling. Uh, the other thing is um, the, the way these uh, these, these uh, components rotate is, is important to keep straight. So, for instance, if I just look at the spatial part of the wave function, a to the e i k x times x, right, and I, I make a plot of the real and imaginary part of that wave function, right, the uh, angle is now given by the product of k sub x times x. And so as uh, x increases, for instance, this vector a uh, will then rotate in the uh, counterclockwise direction as I've shown by the, 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 this arrow. Right? So this, uh, this function uh, is a rotating function, a, a counterclockwise rotating function as x increases because the angle uh, the the uh, vector A makes with respect to the real axis is given by the product of k sub x times x. Okay? Likewise, if I look at the uh, time dependent part of this uh, function, e to the minus i omega t, I can analyze it in exactly the same way. Right? This function is going to have a real and an imaginary component. Right? Uh, the, the minus sign in the argument of the exponent means that the imaginary part of the component is actually going to be going downward. Right? The real part is, is still given by cosine of omega t. And uh, this function will actually operate, or will actually rotate in a clockwise direction as time increases. So if I come back a little bit later in time and I ask where this vector uh, unit length, where this vector lies, it's going to rotate and a clockwise direction is indicated by the arrow here. The uh, amplitude of the time-dependent function is unity, simply because 1 is the, um, is the uh, multiplicative factor here. The amplitude is, 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 is captured by the, the quantity A, and I represented that uh, in the spatial-dependent part of, of the wave function. So if, if those ideas cause you uh, uh, some distress, it's very important for you to get it cleared up now at this point in the course because uh, we're going to assume a lot of this as, as the course evolves and uh, you, ha you really have to be able to go back and unravel things uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you really want to try and understand what's going on. So um, what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to take this time dependent uh, expression that tells how the wave function psi changes with time. We're trying to express that now in terms of the total energy of, a, of, a, of one of these de Broglie waves. The total energy is going to contain two components. One is the kinetic energy, which is p squared over 2m, and the other component is the uh, potential energy. That's going to tell how the, the de Broglie wave interacts with its environments. So the question is, is there a way, is there a simple way to get uh, an energy-like term, a kinetic energy-like term, which is, which is just given by p squared over 2m from this form of the wave function? And the answer is, with a little thought, yeah, you can do it, right? All you have to do is take the second derivative with respect to position of this wave function psi, where the wave function psi is given by this form. You take the second derivative, what you'll find is that you get this kx squared with a minus sign that comes down, right, multiplying the wave function psi. So again, this is an eigenvalue type problem because it says here's an operator, second derivative of, of, with respect to x, operating on the wave function psi. I get something back, in this case, the something is minus kx squared times the wave function psi back itself. Okay? And then you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't a kinetic energy term because a kinetic energy term is going to have to involve a, a h bar squared k squared over 2m. So what we just do is we multiply both sides of this equation by minus h bar squared over 2m. And then we end up with this, this eigenvalue problem here where the kinetic energy of the particle now becomes the eigenvalue 
Uh, this operator operating on the wave function side gives this eigenvalue, which is the kinetic energy times the wave function side back again. So <clears throat> this is an important result, uh, and it just it just just speaks to the virtue of this wave function. Right? This wave function is an extremely versatile wave function. It allows you to pull off these uh, these identifications uh, in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, here, what I try to do is I just try to uh, provide a little bit of physical insight into the time derivative of, of the wave function psi that we discussed uh, in the previous lecture. This is an attempt to tie uh, time derivatives back to rotations. There was a homework problem where I, I, I tried to show you that if you if you calculate the wave function, how the wave how a quantity changes with time. Uh, well, let's back up. If we have a wave function psi that's represented by this vector, the change in that wave function with respect to psi is at right angles to this wave function psi. Right? If you want to project this right angle uh, uh, time derivative back on the psi itself, the, the way to do that is multiply by this quantity i. So this was, a, again, a homework problem that was discussed. And you can see multiplying i times partial of psi with respect to t is equivalent to a 90 degree rotation. And it, it basically projects this time derivative back onto itself. And so if you ever wonder what this i is, is doing in, in, in the time derivative of Schrodinger's equation, it's basically accomplishing this rotation uh, that, that's illustrated in this, uh, this uh, slide. Uh, so what we can do is we can now generalize this, uh, this result for the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x. Uh, we can generalize that by including the potential energy function u of x. Right? And, uh, we can then write an equation that says the total energy E uh, times the wave function psi is equal to this potential energy function u of x, which we don't know, we haven't specified yet times this px squared over 2m, right, times psi uh, back itself again, right? And this is, this is an equation that just expresses conservation of energy multiplied by this, this crazy function psi, right? So there's nothing strange about this. But what we've been able to show, if you follow the notes, if you actually sit down and work through those notes, we've been able to show that this equation here is really equivalent to this equation that's boxed in uh, and colored in yellow, right? And this is uh, Schrodinger's time dimension, uh, Schrodinger's time dependent uh, wave equation in one dimension. Now we didn't actually derive it, we tried to make it uh, uh, plausible, and uh, uh, it's basically an expression of, as you, I hope you can see, it's basically an expression of conservation of energy, which goes back to the Hamilton-Jacobi results for uh, classical particles, right? So that is a, a derivation in quotes of, of Schrodinger's equation. And uh, what we're going to do now for the rest of the semester, basically, is investigate uh, solutions to this equation and see what those solutions uh, allow us to predict. Um, this time-dependent Schrodinger equation can be reduced to a time-independent Schrodinger equation, right? And the time-independent Schrodinger equation uh, is written like this, where now the time derivative of psi is replaced simply by the total energy E, uh, uh, as we've already derived, right? So that, that equivalence between the time derivative, right? Here's the time derivative of, of psi with respect to t multiplied times i uh, h bar. That's equivalent to this total energy e. Right? And this is this is referred to as the time independent Schrodinger's equation. So uh, we'll uh, we'll spend a lot of time discussing that uh, that equation the rest of the week and actually into the semester. Uh, just to give you an example, right? This, this quantity u of x, I haven't I haven't really specified what that is. Uh, that depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. To be honest, right? 
So, for instance, uh, we're going to spend a, a better part of a month talking about the Schrodinger's solution to the hydrogen atom. We're going to talk about the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions uh, that Schrodinger's equation uh, supports. And, uh, and when we talk about that, we're going to write down the fact that the potential energy between a proton and an electron uh, electrostatically interacting one with respect to another. It's not a function of x, it's actually a function of the radial separation between the proton and the electron. That's given from classical physics by this quantity 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught e squared over r. The minus sign just tells you that the electron and the proton have opposite, uh, opposite polarities, right? So uh, this is an example of how you have to put something into Schrodinger's equation in order to get answers out. In other words, you have to understand the problem well enough to uh, formulate a potential energy function that you can put into Schrodinger's equation. Then you have to solve for psi, and in the process of solving for psi, you're going to find the allowed energies uh, that Schrodinger's equation predicts. So that's, that's kind of the, the, uh, the big picture. I, in fact, if you want to see where we're going to go in the next uh, next week or two, uh, <clears throat> we're going to we're going to take Schrodinger's equation, right, and we're going to discuss uh, various examples. Uh, we're going to apply it to some very simple problems, particles in boxes. Right, we're going to we're going to show you confinement energies and the energies that these particles uh, acquire when they're confined in small regions of space. And we're going to talk about quantum tunneling. Uh, we're going to talk about barrier penetration, quantum transmission through barriers. Right, there's a, it's another uh, topic. And then finally, we'll devote a, a large number of, of lectures to, uh, to solving the hydrogen atom and, and uh, pulling out the quantum numbers and, uh, and trying to, uh, to explain the energy eigenvalues. Uh, the, the solution for the hydrogen atom is truly remarkable. It reproduces all the Bohr's results that were derived in 1911, um, and it predicts a lot more. So uh, stay tuned. That's a really, uh, really interesting story, and it um, it certainly was important in validating this this um, derivation of Schrodinger's equation that we've just gone through uh, in the past two lectures. So. Um, if you come back for the next lecture, uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, Schrodinger's equation applied to a free particle. This is the simplest case we can uh, imagine, and uh, it'll be important to understand uh, those, uh, uh, that discussion in, in great detail. The arithmetic is very simple, and uh, it uh, gives some insight into what Schrodinger's equation is, is actually predicting. So, see you for the next lecture. Thank you very much.